Good morning. We welcome you this morning, whether you're a, a member or a guest here, we welcome you to the Reedland Church. Thankful you're here. Uh, that was our Winterfest video. Kaylin did a great job on it. If you have uh, compliments, pay those to Kaylin. She did a really good job. Fun trip. We all made it back safely, including Baby Yoda. Um, great group of kids, chaperones, adults, uh, uplifting time. So uh, thankful to be able to make that trip. A few announcements this morning. First, a specific prayer request. Austin Gonzalez, uh, his, uh, the, the grandmother of his daughter, his, his girlfriend's mom, has a, a kidney stone um, that's gotten to a, a worrying size and hopefully we'll have it removed this week in Nashville. And so just please keep Austin and, uh, was, it, was it Debbie Austin? Denise, Denise Partial. Removing kidney, I'm sorry, yeah, the kidney. Um, removing her kidney this week, so keep her in your prayers. There's a, a slide as well. Uh, March is going to be a, a pretty full month for the church. If you've, you've been here, you know that already. The building is coming together. There's still some things left to be done, but Easter's coming up. We're hoping to, to move back, Lord willing, by then into the main building, and there will be some steps we'll have to take to, to do that. So I'm putting these up on, on the slide. If you have a phone and you want to take a picture of this, I encourage you to do that because these are significant uh, milestones that will happen in the, in the month of March. Today, there are sheets that I've put out on the table here, the table there, and the table there. And if you've gotten one and you've looked at it and said, hey, this looks like a lot like a sheet we got back in December, then you are both an ob obedient and observant person, and I thank you. Um, this is kind of a next step. I just called it three more steps toward faith at home, uh, a focus for the church that we don't want to lose track of. Um, how can we be faithful at home, whether we live by ourselves or with our families? There are scriptures. There's a revisiting of, of the family values. 
step from December, and then there's an invitation to consider doing a fast for Lent, uh, which is stretches from Ash Wednesday up until Easter. So that's the first thing. That's today. March 10th, and I'm going to be sending out emails this next week or two for both of these things, but I want to mention it now. March 10th is going to be what I'm just calling a dream session, especially for parents uh, with kids in the home. So we had the, the Sunday with Johnny Markham back in October. This will be sort of the next step from that. Uh, and I have some things to propose, but I also I want to hear things that you'd like to see as well uh, to be in partnership with you, especially as parents. Food will, will be provided. There will be lunch. Teens are encouraged to stay and babysit the younger kids, um, but more details to come on that. March 16th, the following Saturday, will be the the interest meeting for greeters and attendants. I've sent out an email to, to many of you for that. It went to some of your, your junk mail. Most people have responded, some haven't. So those who haven't, I'll reach out to you directly so hopefully we can um, know for sure if you're interested or not. In that same event, we'll have a, a walkthrough with the parents. So basically the kids area, we'll walk through with the parents and we'll look like a, what it will look like for greeters and attendants when we go back. We'll show a movie for the kids, bring your kids, teens, we'll babysit, there will be food, snacks, um, but that will be a helpful Saturday too. The next Saturday, March 23rd from 2 to 4, will be at the Easter party at the Brophy House. Um, in the past, there's been a helicopter with Easter eggs. I think Brian said we're like importing a volcano this year maybe full of Easter eggs. Just whatever in, is in Brian's brain will happen. Um, and we'll all see it together. But that's uh, March 23rd from 2 to 4. And finally, the following Sunday at Long Less will be Easter Sunday. Our hope and our plan is to be fully back in there. We may have a, a work day to, to make that happen before then, but we'll have a dedication ceremony for the Royce Templeton uh, gathering place from 9 to 10 instead of class. Then we'll have our Easter Sunday, and then you'll be free to go celebrate that with your families afterward. Again, I will send out emails with de more details on some of these things. This uh, slide may become a feature over the next few weeks but just want to clearly communicate what, what's to come in the month of March. Um, so now we'll transition into our time of worship. Good morning. Good morning. You're welcome to stand for the next two songs if you'd like. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love.
go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow. Shepherds this morning. I want to pray for Glenn. I want to pray for Steve. I want to pray for Jean as they continue to lead our church. I want you to watch over them. I pray for them, Father. I want to pray for our staff. Father, I want to pray for Brian. I want to pray for Terrell. I want to pray for Jared and and, and, and Miss Melissa. Please watch over them and help them to continue to do what they do to keep things rolling the way they do around here at church. Father, thank you for our our new building that's underway. I want you to continue to bless that and please. Help that that timeline that Jared presented this morning is is doable, and with, with you we know it is, Father. Father, continue to uh, bless the service and bless us as we leave here this afternoon. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. <laughs> I will worship with all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength. I will seek you.
Good morning. What is that picture that's on the screen this morning? Anybody know what that is? Might, not, might be a little blurry. That would be the Eiffel Tower. Yes. Yes, it is. So what does the Eiffel Tower have to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, if you'll give me a minute or two, maybe I'll try to tie these two things together. The story is about a man, a French man, by the way. His name is Richard Plaud. You can go ahead and put his picture up there. Richard Plaud, in 2009, saw a replica of the Eiffel Tower. And he got to start to dream. Now, what he saw was a replica of the Alpha Tower built out of matches. Something similar to that right there. And he started to dream. He started to plan. Eight years ago, he started putting his plan into action. He started to develop, conceptualize. And after six months of that, he started to build. His goal was to build a replica of the Eiffel Tower taller than anyone had ever done before out of matches. His whole point was so that he could get himself into the Guinness World Book of Records as having the highest, the tallest replica of matches ever designed. Seven and a half years ago when he started building, he was buying these matches at his local grocery store. And he would go home and he would start to manipulate these matches to build the Eiffel Tower. And what he would do is he would take, this one has a green head on it, and he would take and cut the head off of it. And he would continue to work with these and build and manipulate these matchsticks. After a while, he got tired of having to cut the heads off of them. So he contacted the manufacturer and he said, hey, could you do me a favor? Could you sell me some of these without the heads on them so I don't have to cut them off anymore? The manufacturer obliged him and they sent him 33 pounds, 33 pounds of these matches without the heads on them. And he continued to build. Until late 2023, when he finished what he had built, it was a 145th scale model. He used over 700,000 of these matches, 50 pounds of glue. He spent 4,000. 200 hours to create the following. He built it to a height of 23 and a half feet, meeting the previous height by two feet. It took him a period of time to construct this on site because he had to build it in his living room and then have it moved to where it is now so that he would have somewhere high enough to display it. He put it together. January 2024, he invited the Guinness people to see what he had created, to put himself into the record book. 
McGinnis came. And they reviewed what he had put out there. And in the end, they flat out rejected his submission. The reason? Because he had cut the heads off the matches. And Guinness said it's because it was no longer a commercially made match that you would find in a store somewhere. They flat out rejected his construction. And that got me to thinking this last week about rejection. And it got to thinking about another book, this book, the Bible. It got me thinking about what if my story, what if I was born in biblical time? Would my story be one of exception from God or rejection by God? And I got to thinking about Cain, one who killed someone. I got to thinking about David. For all practical purposes, he had someone killed. And I got to thinking about Judas, the fact that he allowed someone to be killed. And I'm thinking to myself, I know that all of those people wouldn't want certain parts of their story to be revealed in Scripture. But what about my story? Well, there's times in my life that I'm glad that my story is not part of biblical canon. There's things that I don't want being read for all of history. But at the same time, I will interject and I will contend to you that I think that your story, my story, our story is intertwined in Scripture. That the basis for your story, my story, our story has foundation in Scripture. Whether that be from Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the story of creation, about the fact that we were all created in God's image, male and female. Or how about from Isaiah chapter 53, where we're foretold of Christ and his coming and the fact that he would take away all of our sins. How about from John 17, where Jesus is praying for all those of his disciples and those who would come after. That's us. Or the vision of John in Revelation 5 where it is revealed that heaven and that God created it all for his creation. I contend to you this morning that we serve a God who does not want to exploit your failures. God wants to exalt, extol your faithfulness. God does not want to condemn you. God wants to comfort you. And we serve a God that does not want to reject us. We serve a God who wants to accept us. Now, Full disclosure, Guinness reconsidered, and he's now officially the record holder. So, there is that. And that what brings us before the table this morning, is God's love and acceptance of us. And as we get ready to break bread this morning around this table, the share in the love that God has for us. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning because of the sacrifice of your son and the indwelling of your spirit. And we know that you love us and you accept us. You've never wanted to reject us. And because of that, we are eternally grateful and we thank you for each new day that you give us. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 47. 
clap your hands, all ye nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nation. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Thank you for that reading, Tristan. I want to get all the kids up here. And I'm going to ask the teenagers to join us today if they will. So all of our kiddos and any of our teenagers, we're going to sing a song and I need a little help. All right, come on. Come on up here, guys. Come on up here. All right. Let's put the handsome ones in the front. Y'all can decide who that is. All right. All right, guys. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about rejection today, and that's a sad thing, but what's the opposite of being rejected? Not being rejected. Good. What were you saying? Accepted. Being accepted. Yeah, being accepted. Yeah. And it feels good to be accepted, right? It feels good when you have a friend and somebody who loves you and they're excited to see you. You know, I have a dog. His name's Teddy. And when I come home, he is so excited to see me. His tail starts wagging and he smiles. He pulls his teeth back. He looks like he's going to eat you, but he's smiling as he's so excited and you feel accepted. You feel loved. So, There is a song, and some of y'all have sang this, so you're going to have to stand up. And what we're going to do is, guys, this song has motions and actions. We're going to tell you to hug people and high-five them and shake their hands. And what I want you to do is I want you to go all throughout the congregation, and I want you to find somebody who looks like they're not having very much fun, and I want you to help them have fun. You shake their hand, you give them a high-five, whatever the song tells us to do. The song is called Jesus is a Friend. So we're going to sing it just one time here together, and then we'll go out through and accept everybody. All right. Jesus is a friend, is a friend next to you. Jesus is a friend, so sing along. Jesus is a friend, is a friend next to you. Jesus is a friend, so sing. Sing a hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Okay, so now we're going to add some motions. We're going to say, shake somebody's hand. So go find somebody who's got a sourpuss face and they don't look like they're having fun. And you make them have fun. You go find somebody and you make them have fun, all right? Go get them. Shake somebody's hand, shake a hand next to you. Shake someone's hand and sing along. Shake someone's hand, shake a hand next to you. Shake someone's hand and sing. Sing a hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now find somebody else. Find somebody else. Give a high five, high five next to you. Give a high five and sing along. Give a high five, high five next to you. Give a high five and sing. Sing a hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now this is the one where you got to find the sourest person, somebody that looks like Dale, you know, because you're going to tweak their beak. Tweak, tweak. Tweak someone's beak, tweak a beak next to you. Tweak someone's beak and sing along. Tweak someone's beak, tweak a beak next to you. Tweak someone's beak and sing. Sing a hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. One more person. Hey, five more. Give someone a hug, give a hug next to you. Give someone a hug and sing along. Give someone a hug, give a hug next to you. Give someone a hug and sing. Sing a hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Good job, everybody. You guys can sit down.
Nothing to bother people as much as getting kids to tweak your beak, you know? That's always a fun one. All right. Jared talked about uh, Winterfest, showed the video. I want to say again, what a great trip that was. Jared did a fantastic job. Uh, Ryan does uh, all the administrative uh, and organizational work, and he did a just an excellent job. Ryan does a lot of administrative and organizational work. He did a, uh, not just on that, did an excellent job. Darren uh, fed us like kings, uh, a bunch of other chaperones. They, we just really appreciate it. So let's give a round of applause for all those adults who went and helped. <clears throat> it, it is a big deal. Big deal to give up a give up a weekend and uh, go down there with a bunch of teenagers. Of course, our teenagers made it easy on us. They were so good, so pleasant. So we really appreciate that. Before I start into the sermon, I do want to give you a quick uh, building update, expand a little bit more on kind of where we are and what the plan is. Right now, the contractor. We had this conversation this week. They believe that unless just something goes totally wrong, they plan to be out and done by March seventh. So, which is really exciting. So we're really excited about that. Now. We have some projects, and I know many of you know about this because many of you are doing these projects. We have some projects that we're doing that doesn't mean that we can be in on March 8th, right? So we have some teams that are working. There is a team that's been working on uh, furnishing the children's area, and that is, is moving along. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff purchased. There's going to be security cameras going up in there, TVs going up in there, all kinds of stuff. There's going to be some uh, graphics going to be put on the walls. So there's stuff that's happening there. We have a team that's been working on the gathering place in the patio, acquiring uh, the furniture for that, putting up the pergola. So all that's going to be proceeding over the next couple weeks. Uh, we're going to be kind of working around the contractors some of the time, and then after they finish, uh, the uh, um, <clears throat> just so everybody knows, the air conditioners will have a shade in front of them. A lot of people ask. There will be a nice, you know, it'll match the material, so they won't. You won't see those air conditioners from the street every time you drive by. Um, the playground, we've got some folks that are working on putting these pipes in and hanging the shades over the playground over the next coming weeks and months. Um, and then we will need to do a big flip-flop for furniture and tech. Now, those may or may not happen on the same day. Uh, right now, the, the big furniture flip-flop will probably be on Sunday the 24th. And I know some of you are thinking, well, if they're out by the 7, why is it going to take so long? We're still going to have other people in here painting, hanging things, doing stuff uh, for a couple weeks, and it's going to take a little while. We also want to launch with our security, our, our ushers and our children's check-ins uh, functioning and those people trained, and so that's going to take a little while as well, and some of you received emails about that. You'll be getting an update about that probably this week about when we would like to start doing some training for that. Um, so probably March 24th, it could be the weekend before that, but probably the 24th we'll do the furniture flip. And um, that will be, we'll need a lot of people that afternoon because we'll be picking up all the chairs, we'll be moving all the stuff that's in here out there and getting everything reset so that we can use it on Easter Sunday. The big dedication weekend on Easter Sunday, there'll be a mail out going out to about 800 homes uh, in our neighborhood, inviting them, saying, hey, if you're curious what we've been doing, come on and check it out, it's Easter weekend. We are on Good Friday, uh, that Friday night. We're having the Metropolitan Detroit Youth Chorus, which is a chorus uh, I was in when I was growing up. I've got nieces and nephews in it now. They're wonderful. They're going to come here and sing um, on Friday night. And so I encourage you to come. We're going to invite people from the community. There are some other churches that may be coming. Um, and then we'll have our dedication that morning. It will be a ribbon cutting. Uh, we do have a plaque in memory of Royce that will be unveiled. It's going to be a really special, uh, special morning. And, of course, then we'll have our Easter worship service. So, if everything works out, that's kind of the timeline that we're, we're working on. And uh, then there are a few things the contractor will come back and finish in the summer. They're going to do a little asphalt work, sealing the parking lots and things like that. Some of the paint on the brick, all that has to be done when it's good and hot and dry out. So, there'll be a few little things that'll, that'll wait until summer to get touched up. Now, <clears throat> financially, uh, if you've seen the thermometer there in the back... Uh, it's been uh, kind of hovering in that just under 200000 mark for a while. We had about $300,000 that we had to raise in order to just pay cash and not have any kind of loan. So we raised right about one hundred and ninety dollars uh, so far. So that leaves some more money. I don't know, math, $110,000. i am just kidding. At least $110,000. Uh, that we have to either raise in the next month 
or take out as a loan. Now we have been approved from the bank and um, we're, we're prepared to take that out as a loan if we need to, but obviously we would rather not have to. So if you feel like, hey, the church does not need to take out a loan, we need to pay for this, this is your opportunity to write a check for $110,000. You know, you've been <laughs> waiting to hear those words for a long time. No, if you have been waiting and thinking, hey, I could give and I haven't yet, or I could give a little more, uh, we really need to, you to do that in the next month or so, uh, so that we really, in the next two weeks, so we know, because then we have to actually start here in the next two weeks or so on the process of getting that loan, all the paperwork done and everything. And we can't just wait till Easter and then say, oh, by the way, bank, we need the money. It doesn't work that way. So if you were planning on giving or you want to give more, this is the time to say, hey, I do want to chip in. Secondly, and we're giving opportunity for everybody in here to chip in in some way, small or big, through our blessing box. So over by the thermostat back there, you will see there is a metal box that, Darren, you're doing a Vanna White for us here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, that box, uh, you flip up the lid, there's a slot. We are asking, like we did a couple of years ago, to live out what we see in the book of Acts, where the people uh, sold their belongings and brought their, you know, sold their possessions and brought the money uh, and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was used for the good of the kingdom. We are asking you, during the season of Lent, between now and Easter, to just find something. And, and really, to be honest, it can be anything. It, 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 it could be anything um, that you would like to and sell it and put the money in the box. So you might be saying, hey, I would love to give or give more to this project, but I really don't have the resources to do that. But you know what? I have this old, you know, uh, golf club driver from 20 years ago, and it just sits here, and I keep thinking I should get rid of it, and I could sell it for 100 bucks, and I could put that money in. Great. You know, or you might say, I have this investment over here and it's just been sitting there and it was my you know, aunt gave it to me and I could sell that and give it. Or you might say, hey, I've got this baseball card and we want everybody to be able to participate. Even our littlest ones, you have this baseball card and mom's dad, you can help them to sell that, you know, and then they can put the money in the box. So whether it's 50 cents or $5 or $500 or $5,000, everybody has the opportunity as, as an act of a spiritual discipline to choose something and I'd like to say, hey, pick something really important to you, make it a sacrifice, but really it may not be that may, may the case. You might just have something you say, this is an obvious yeah. thing, you know, but I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord. Just don't lie about it. We know that from Acts. That doesn't work. <laughs> I sold over $100. Here you go. And it was really 200 That doesn't work out well. Okay, don't do that. But <clears throat> sell something, put the money in the box and uh, between now and Easter, and then all that will go towards, uh, you know, relieving us from having to take out a loan. So... Uh, it's a re really neat way to actively participate. Please help our little ones to participate. They will need your help, okay? Help the little ones to participate in that as well. All right, I want to take you all the way back to 1954. So it's 1954, and there is a very handsome 19-year-old man from Tupelo, Mississippi, wandering around town with his guitar. He's been playing guitar since he was about 10, but he was pretty shy about playing in front of people for most of his life. And the reason that he was shy might be because when he was in grade school, one time he brought his guitar and he played and sang at school in the sixth grade and all of his classmates teased him and called him that trashy kid who plays hillbilly music. Well, eventually he moved towns. He tried to start over. But uh, when he took a music class in eighth grade, he didn't do too well. He got a C. His teacher told him he had no aptitude for singing. He never did learn to read music. And all of his friends, or all the people at school, bullied him and called him a mama's boy. But through it all, he kept playing, mostly jamming out some rockabilly with some people who lived in his neighborhood. But finally, in 1953, he got up the guts to enter a talent show in his high school. And it worked. People liked it. For the first time, his peers started to notice this handsome young man with the guitar. So in August of 1953, this young man walked into a downtown recording service company. He paid to have two songs recorded on a vinyl record as a birthday present for his mother. As part of the deal, the record or service owner would also send the record out to some local radio stations who promptly did not play it at all. In fact, they weren't interested. It got zero attention. So this enterprising young man thought, well, hey, you know, nobody makes it on the first try. So he went back, he saved up some money, he recorded two more songs, an A-side and a B-side, one more vinyl record, took it to the radio stations himself. They didn't play it. Nobody was interested in this trashy kid playing hillbilly music. Nobody cared. So he thought, you know what? 
First, you don't succeed. Try, try again. Let me try something a little different. There was a local quartet called the Songfellows. He thought, you know what? I'll try out for the quartet. He got rejected. There was a local band. He wasn't a good enough guitar player. Didn't get in. Then, finally, his big break. The recording service owner thought he would give him a shot to record a cover of the 1946 blues song, That's All Right. The song got picked up on the radio and listeners loved it and they called in to hear it again and again and again. So let's listen to a little bit of this cover of the 1946 song, That's All Right, retitled That's All Right Mama. Well, that's all right, Mama. That's all right. Any guesses yet? That's all right, Mama. Just any way you do, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right, Mama. Am I giving it away yet? You may guess by now the person we're talking about is. Elvis Presley, yeah. Some of y'all had me when I said Tupelo, Mississippi. Some of you had me when I said it was a birthday present for his mama. Some of you are going, who's Elvis? That's okay, too. Elvis may be, arguably is, the most famous and most successful solo artist of the 20th century, selling roughly 400 million records worldwide. Uh, record, he set the record for the most certified RIAA gold and platinum albums. He has the most albums that have ever charted on the Billboard Top 200, 14 Grammy nominations, three wins, including a Lifetime Achievement Award when he was only 34. He was in 33 films, numerous TV specials, and all of this before he died at the age of 42, which sounds a lot younger now than it used to. You might not know it, but uh, all of this almost never happened. Because when That's All Right Mama started getting played on the air in Memphis and people were calling in, requesting it again and again, Sam Phillips, owner of Sun Recording Service, said, hey, Elvis, I think we got something here. And so they, they spent the money to press up a bunch of records and they sent them with letters to radio stations and record companies all over the country trying to get Elvis picked up on the radio and on a national record deal. They didn't get a good response. In fact... There is a letter that was auctioned off a couple years ago, and it came back from a West Coast record label called Monarch Record Manufacturing Company. And their response, dated March 21st, 1955, Monarch Records executive Nate Duroff reads, I have given him samples of your last release, and he is not of the opinion that Elvis Presley would sell in Los Angeles. I know for a fact, Western and Hillbilly out here stinks as far as sales. Elvis Presley rejected. Elvis Presley. This is less than 12 months before Heartbreak Hotel will become an international hit and Elvis will be a global sensation. Less than a year before that and he is outright rejected saying, your music stinks. There is no market for this. Nobody's going to like it. Maybe down there in Memphis, but not in the rest of the world. Rejection hurts, doesn't it? You been there? You, you felt it before? You know, maybe you weren't turned down by a major record label 12 months before you became a global superstar, but I think we've all been rejected. And everybody's hearts and minds go to a different place when you think about rejection. Maybe you were turned down for a job you thought was yours. Maybe you were passed over for a promotion you thought you were going to get. Maybe you got gossiped about by a close friend. Or maybe it's way back in fourth grade when you got out a piece of paper and a pencil and you wrote, Will you be my girlfriend? Check yes or no. You folded it up, and you passed it back, and you watched as it went through. No, no, no not to her. Oh, to her. Don't put it to the wrong person. Okay, yeah, she got it. And you watched her get out her pencil. She did this. She folded it back up, passed it back, and you watched it hand over hand as you're sweating, and your palms are sweating, and you got the note, and you pulled it back, and you opened it up, and she checked no. <laughs> or maybe it's worse. Maybe she checked yes. And maybe you became boyfriend and girlfriend and you were going out. Forget the fact you never went anywhere. 
Forget the fact that you didn't even talk to her on the playground. You were cool because you were going out. And it lasted a while until she, you know, broke up with you. And um, maybe she broke up with you something like this note right here. <laughs> this note uh, says, Sean, I'm breaking up with you. You have not talked to me since the day you asked me out. <laughs> that was three months ago. You need to get it together or you will never get married and that would be sad. You should get married, just not to me, Rachel. Rachel. Have you been there? Listen, I did the note thing, check yes or no. She checked no, and I was like, never again, never again. Now, I, I finally gave in, and one other time I did send a note, and thankfully Alicia checked yes, but that was it. That was the last time. Because rejection hurts. It just hurts. And, you know, you get, get rejected by somebody or broken up with like that and you know there's there's a lot of pain there and you know of course they're not all like Rachel's note here they're they're not all romantic you know in the serious romance of the fourth grade sometimes they can be like other kinds of rejection like when you're rejected by your children you know here's a rejection note uh, from a child to a parent it says mom I'm going to run away tomorrow at 9 30 when you and dad are sleeping be sure you say goodbye forever and ever (laughs) Emily P.S. I will be packing tonight you know, sometimes a kid, you know, they, they, they reject you. They want to run away. Uh, it, it's kind of nice uh, when your kids leave you a note explaining maybe why, uh, like this one here. Um, why are you running away? Well, I won't love you if you make you clean my room. So at least it's not just an outright rejection. There's a, a reason there, you know. Or um, this one might be even a little easier to swallow. Mom, I ran away not because uh, you're mean to me or anything. I only wanted to meet the Spice Girls, Sarah. <laughs> it's understandable, sure, you know. Who doesn't want to meet the Spice Girls, right? So there, there could be a good reason for it. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's not both parents that are rejected, right? Maybe it's one or the other, like this one. I love Mama like Daddy, you know. That, you know so it's just Mom is at least accepted here. Um, there might be a reason, though, for this. You know, maybe there's a reason that he's rejecting dad. I think this next note spells that out. Uh, Dear God, I want to be just like my daddy when I get older, but not with so much hair all over. Sam. <laughs> I think what it is, though, is with our kids, you know, we want them to love us. We want them to be loyal to us. So any kind of rejection like that kind of hurts, kind of stings a little bit. And so I just want to share with you one note of the ideal kid. This is, this is the ideal note you get from your kid when they're telling you they love you, they're accepting you. Dear mom, thank you so much for being my mom. If I had a different mom, I would punch her in the face and go find you. Love, Brooke. <laughs> now, you don't want to be rejected. Brooke is the kid you want to have. But seriously, um, those are funny, but a kid running away really isn't funny. And a lot of parents have dealt with you know, that kind of rejection. A lot of us have dealt with the kind of rejection from a child or from a parent or from a lover, a a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a spouse that leaves, you know, a a job that passes you over. Serious, deep, emotionally tied relationships that no longer exist and maybe never did. And you start to doubt everything because you were rejected by somebody who you thought loved you. Or maybe you worked for a company who you sacrificed a lot for because of what they promised you and they walked away from the table leaving you holding the bag, leaving you des- destitute and with no future, no hope. Uh, just, rejection just stinks. And, and we can laugh about it because otherwise we'd cry, right? Because it hurts. It just really hurts. So today we're going to talk about one of God's uh, chosen leaders and how he dealt with rejection because dealing with rejection is something we're all going to have to do because we all will feel the pain of it and Samuel felt it too so if you've got your Bibles you can turn to the book of 1 Samuel in the 8th chapter we're going to be reading from there we'll be moving around in the book a little bit but uh, mostly we'll be right there in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and start in the very first verse now just as a reminder of course Samuel he grew up Eli raised him in the tabernacle he is a priest he is a leader, spiritual leader. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, 
And the name of his secondborn was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. So now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Two weeks ago, we talked about Eli. Eli was a high priest, and his sons stole the sacrifices and sexually took advantage of the women at the tabernacle gate, and yet God still chose to use Eli as a force in the life of Samuel. Now Samuel, who came from a barren yet prayerful mother, had been dedicated to the Lord, raised in the tabernacle. He takes on the role of the priest, but he also takes on the role of judge. Now, what's a judge? Ever since God brought the people into the promised land, he's raised up judges to lead them against oppressors. So they have a priest as the spiritual leader of the people, but guess what a priest isn't supposed to do? A priest isn't ever supposed to touch a dead body, right? So when there was a call, when there's violence against the people and they needed somebody to rise up and stop being violently oppressed, God would usually raise up a judge. So Samuel is also a judge. He stands in the line of great heroes. Now, you, some, you guys know some of these heroes. Ehud. Ehud is the left-handed dagger man who overthrew the Moabite king. Deborah. She was the prophetess who rose up an army to attack and overthrow Jabin, the king of Canaan. Gideon. He led 300 men to rout the entire Midianite army. And Samson, the man with the strength to kill lions and carry off city gates who even in his death killed 3,000 Philistines, thus delivering the Israelites. So we know these names. And these are just some of the mighty judges whose exploits are celebrated. And at this time, there's been this long line of these heroes, these mighty warrior heroes. And now, Samuel stands in their lineage. He is not only the high priest, but he is the final judge of Israel. pretty good legacy right except he's not he's not being seen as a hero by the people you see he has a bit of the same problem as Eli he has adult sons who are dishonest and who dishonor God and the people know that Samuel is getting quite old and they're losing faith in him so they say to him give us a king we don't want you anymore we certainly don't want your sons we want a king Give us a king so we can be just like everyone else. Now, if you ever grew up in a house where there were certain words you weren't supposed to say, and I'm not talking about the really bad ones, I'm talking about one specific to your house, you know what we're talking about here. Well, we don't say that in this house. No, we weren't ever allowed to say stupid. You could say, we don't say that in this house, right? Well, dad says it. Well, that doesn't count. You're not allowed to say it, right? You know those words like that in your house, maybe? All right, in the house of Israel, the words you never say are, we just want to be like everybody else. Mm, We don't say that. We don't say that here. That is a potty word, young man. Why? Because God called Israel as a nation to be taken out of the nations, to be set apart, to be holy, to be separate. Their whole identity was based on them not being like everyone else. So we don't need to underestimate the weight of this statement. That when the people are saying, give us a king so we can be just like everyone else. This means that the people have completely lost their identity. They have completely lost their identity as God's chosen people. They don't say, give us a king so that X, Y, or Z, you know, he can tax us, he can fight our battles, he can you know, increase our agriculture output. He can, 
bring in new technology. They don't say any of that. They say, give us a king so we can be like everybody else. And God's response later will kind of be like, ask them if they know how it's working for everybody else. And say, don't work too well. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your sons into war. He's going to take your best of your land and the best of your crops. And he's going to tax you. And it's not going to be great. And they will care. We don't care. We're embarrassed. We're embarrassed. Now, when I was a kid, there was a brand of pants that everybody wanted to have. And uh, I believe that they made the same pants down here. My wife says they had a different name. I think down here they were called skids. Is that right, skids? They were like hammer pants, and they had a little traffic sign, an orange traffic sign with a car skidding on the back pocket. You all know, remember those? They were very popular in Michigan. But you all remember the hammer pants, right? Hammer pants, okay. So they were the hammer pants, you know, and everybody had them. And then they, if they were really cool, they had the Reebok pump. So they had the Reebok pump and they had the skid pants. And then they had some kind of cross colors was the brand shirt. So it was this shirt with all these bright colors on it. Now, if you were really cool in fifth grade, you had Reebok pumps, skids, hammer pants, and a cross colors shirt. I didn't have any of those. I had British Knights, which were not cool. There was a time when British Knights were cool. These were not cool. This was like, actually, no, I, I think I didn't even have British Knights then. I think I had uh, kangaroo shoes as a brand. Anyway, they were just whatever the cheap shoes were. I had the really cheap shoes, okay? My mom had gone to the thrift store, and she had found a pair of, like, paisley decorated, like, women's, you know, pants that looked kind of like hammer pants. And she said, these are them. I'm like, no, they're not. She's like, yeah, they are. I'm like, no, they're not. And then I had a sweatshirt that had some neon colors on it, but it said, like, Jones Family Reunion that she got somewhere. And she's like, you look just like the other kids. And I was like, no, I don't. I wore it. And guess what? I was embarrassed. I wore that outfit to school, and the kids with their Reebok pumps and their hammer pants and their cross-color shirts all looked at me, and they were like, what are you wearing? I'm like, same thing. My mom said it's the same thing. She's like, are those your sister's pants? I was like, no, they're totally not. I wanted to be just like everybody else. You know, and we all could probably go back in history, and you could think of something, a time when you wanted what other people had, and you didn't have it, and you felt like, I'm standing out like a sore thumb here. I'm a bad imitation. That's how Israel felt. They're like, they all have kings. They got these armies. They got these really cool chariots. They got, you know, fortresses. And what do we have? An old man who walks around telling us God said this and God said that. We want to be like the rest of the people. They laugh at us, Samuel. Come on, give us a king. And Samuel feels hurt. And he feels rejected. Because he's given his whole life to serving these people. And they don't want him anymore. So we'll go on, and, and, and let's read that again when the elders come to him. The elders, this is verses 4 through 8. The elders of Israel gathered together. They came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, and he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And they have done this from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. And so they are doing this to you. So what do you do when you're rejected and hurt? What's your response? You know, there's a couple of responses that we all have when we're rejected and hurt. One might be we just run away and lick our wounds, you know? You, 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 reach, you send the note, she says no, you're never talking to her again, right? But when you're rejected, a lot of times, like, well, I, I tried that once, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. I'm going to go back and lick my wounds. Or you can get angry and lash out. Sometimes when people are rejected, you know, Joe, I'm sorry, but we're just going to have to let you go. You've always been a good employee, but we're just going to have to let you go. And all of a sudden, Joe busts loose with a tirade, screaming and yelling on the way out the door, he, you know, deletes all his files on his computer, and he says, well, you, you, sometimes people do that. Some people just roll over and give, give up. Some people get, better, get bitter and get revenge, and some people just freeze. They're so hurt. They're so paralyzed, they're incapable of doing anything. Now, Elvis could have done this, right? When Elvis was rejected by the Monarch Record Manufacturing Company, he could have just froze. He could have just froze and said, you know what? I, I don't know what to do next. 
He could have given up and said, I'm done with music. I can't take the rejection. He could have thought, if they say my music stinks, maybe it really stinks. Rejection affects all of us. It makes us back up. We don't like the sting of rejection. We want to quit. We're, doing, we're willing to do just about anything in our power to never feel rejected again. In fact, it even affects mission efforts. Stick with me on this. South of Nairobi, in Kenya, about four miles from the city center, is a massive slum called Kibera. It's home to between half a million and a million people. It's believed to be the largest slum in Africa. There is barely any clean water. There are almost no schools. Unemployment is high. And the average family lives, earns less than $2 a day. 12% of the people are living with HIV. Garbage and raw sewage flow through the streets. And there are virtually no public utilities or health services of any kind. Development workers have a nickname for Kibera. Scorched Earth. That's what they call it. Scorched Earth. Nothing can grow there. Nothing good can come from there. In fact, for decades, non-governmental organizations have poured millions of dollars in financial and human resources into the slum with almost no long-term results. These organizations get frustrated at the lack of results and the overwhelming problems, so they often close up shop early and move somewhere else where they think they can make a difference, oftentimes leaving the people in the neighborhood they were trying to serve worse off than they were before they came, oftentimes doing more harm than good. So in the words of Elvin Mabola, who's a community development worker in Kibera, he says, to, to many people, the Kibera slum in Nairobi, Kenya, is a place with no equals. It is filthy, congested, degraded, and unfit for human habitation. Like the proverbial scripture referencing the birthplace of Jesus Christ, many people believe that nothing good can come out of Kabir. They believe it's scorched earth. In the book, When Helping Hurts by Stephen Corbett, he talks about this. Agencies that went in with good intentions did more harm than good and left so often that agencies won't even go in now. They're tired of the rejection. They're conditioned to believe they never, ever want that to happen to them again. They came, they worked, they gave money, they dug wells, they bought food, they built schools with no results, and they felt rejected. They were embarrassed that they had wasted time and money. They were demoralized that they had failed. They just wanted to quit, and oftentimes they just blamed the people. Well, these people can't be helped. We'll go somewhere else. These people can't be helped. Again and again and again until it received the nickname Scorched Earth, and nobody wanted to go in there anymore and work. So rejection isn't just something we feel individually. It's actually something that we can feel and act upon societally. So what's the moral? What do we do? What do we do when we feel rejected? Should we give up? Should we quit? Well, may, maybe sometimes you should. Maybe not. When we talk about the story with Samuel, though, I want to press a point on you. Samuel is not the main character of the story. God is. And God makes that clear. So let's look again at that verse. We're going to just read verses 7 and 8. And the Lord said to him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. They have rejected me as their king. If the, Samuel's about sto if the story's about Samuel, then we say, hey, Samuel, you feel rejected. What do you do about it? Samuel, will you continue to honor God? Will you continue to serve the people even though you feel bad? Even though, can you find it within yourself to rise up? But God says, Samuel, that's not the point. It's not you. It's not about you. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And they've done it to me again and again and again from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods. And that's what they're doing to you. It's not you they've rejected. It's me. A thousand years in the future, Jesus will say something very similar to his disciples in John 15. 
if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as it loves its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teachings, they will obey yours. Jesus says to his disciples, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me. We learn a couple things here. One, when we are rejected, (coughs) when we are rejected by the world for following God, we're in good company because they've already rejected God. They rejected the prophets. They rejected his son. When they reject us for following God and they say, oh, you're terrible, you're horrible, you're bigots, you're evil, you're mean, because you honor God, they already rejected God before us. He understands that pain. He must feel it. For the creator of all the universe to be rejected by his creation, for the healer to be rejected by those who are sick and dying, God has felt that pain, and he's with us in it. But more importantly than even that is the second thing that we learn. When God is rejected by the world, he doesn't view it as scorched earth. God doesn't back up and look at the Spirit and the Son and say, that earth I created, that's scorched earth. Nothing good can come from there. No, he goes back in and does what he's always done, which is sustain all things. So we see this in Colossians 1. And I love this verse because it really informs us of what Jesus does beyond what Jesus did on this earth. That Jesus has been working since the beginning of time and even today as the sustainer of all things. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, since the beginning of time, has been sustaining all things keeping the earth spinning, keeping the sun rising, keeping the rain falling. One of the problems that people have with the Kibera slum is that they call it a God-forsaken place. How can there be any good in Kibera if God himself has pulled out and left the people there to drown in their own filth? And this is a falsehood. This is a lie. There is no such thing as a God-forsaken place. It is outside of the character of God to forsake his creation. There is no place on earth that is God forsaken. No matter how much evil, how much sin, how much, you know, poverty, how much pain, how much sickness, how much anything. There's no place that God has forsaken. He is still at work sustaining all things. Jesus is actively working in the Kibera slum to hold that place together. In a broken relationship, in a drunken stupor, in a home filled with violence, there is still God's creation. And distorted as that place may be, distorted by sin, distorted by the fallen world, distorted by brokenness, life in that place only persists because the creator of the universe chooses to sustain it. Distorted as it may be, life in those broken places only exists because the creator of the universe chooses to sustain it. There is no God for second place. So I want to show you some equations here. First one you're going to see says people plus sin minus God equals hell. Just think about that for a minute. You've got people, they sin. If God is not part of that equation, that's hell. Whether it's hell eternal or hell on earth. People plus sin with no God involvement is hell. Next equation. People plus God, minus sin, well, that's heaven. You have people in the presence of God, and they're not sinful. They've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They're made, they're justified, sanctified, they're holy. That's what we're looking forward to in heaven. That is the kingdom of heaven on earth. So on one side, people plus sin, minus God, is hell. On the other side, people plus God, minus sin, is heaven. Those are the two poles, but guess where we live? We live right in the middle. People plus God, plus sin. That's the world we live in, right? There are people, God is at work, and there's also sin. So we think 
man, hell is what happens when God is gone. Heaven is what happens when sin is gone. But what happens right here? Because God and sin are both present in this world. What that is, is the life that we know it. And it is only possible because of the sustaining work of Christ. Because the wages of sin are death. So God has every right to pull out and say, okay, you sinned, you die, you get hell. He has the right to do that. He's chosen to say, I'll take away the sin and we can have heaven. But in the meantime, where you live, this world, your everyday life, your nine to five, your waking, your sleeping, all of that is the life as you know it. And that can only exist because Christ chooses to sustain it. If you lived in the Kibir slum and you got up every day and your mom has HIV and you don't know where you're going to get food and you live on less than $2 a day and your job is to go find Walmart sacks and tie them together to make little soccer balls that you can go sell in the market so that some kid can play soccer with a sack of Walmart, a tied up knot of Walmart sacks, and you might make a dollar doing that, and you're going to take that dollar to go find somebody who has some filthy water that you can take home and hope that your brother was able to get enough money to get some grain, and you can bring that home and you can mix the filthy water with the grain to cook a little piece of bread so that your stomach can just slightly have something in it before you go to bed and you do it all over tomorrow. I would say that sounds a lot like living in hell. It's pretty awful. It sounds as a human like it's God forsaken, like God has rejected that place. But life persists there because of the sustaining work of Christ. And even in the Kibera slum, there are churches and communities of people that are actively working to make life better for all of those people because of the sustaining work of Christ. Because even though God gets rejected in this world, he doesn't give up. He doesn't forsake anything. The life that we know it happens because of the sustaining work of Christ. Every breath you take is because God causes plants to photosynthesize carbon dioxide into oxygen in order to sustain you. Each beat of your heart is because God causes your brain to send electronic pulses down billions of miles of neuron pathways to tell your heart muscle to flex, to push the blood through your body in order to sustain you. Every bite of food you eat is because he sends the sun in season, the rain to the fields, and the hands to harvest that you might have the energy to live another day. He sustains you even as you reject him. Even as I reject him, he sustains us. The grace of God is not just the grace that gets us to heaven. The grace of God is the God that allows us to live to have a chance to hear the gospel and to change this world. And if we look at rejection as, I'm out, we're not being like God. Because he had every right to do it. And he says to Samuel, Samuel, it's not you they've rejected, it's me. And guess what, they've been doing it for 400 years since I took them out of Egypt, but I'm still here. I'm still here. God knows the pain of rejection a whole lot better than any of us. So what do we learn from this? Elvis could have quit. We wouldn't have all the great music. I, I am, a, I admit, I'm a big Elvis fan. I love Elvis. I would have been very sad if he'd have quit. Some psychologists believe that near misses or pain in our life that hurts us but doesn't kill us actually serve to embolden you. We say this colloquially as whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, there actually is, there, there is a line in psychology of, of reasoning about this. And a lot of the study of it goes back to World War II, where Hitler believed that he could bomb the British population into submission. He believed that if he bombed their churches, their schools, their homes, and as those things became little more than rubble and their neighbors and friends died, that the people would eventually cry out to the powers of B, to Winston Churchill, and say, enough is enough. We would rather you give in to the Nazis than let us keep living under this bombardment. Interestingly, the exact opposite happened. The more Hitler bombed London, the harder the resolve of the English people came. This is where we get that idea of keeping a stiff upper lip, that old British sensibility. Yeah, their neighbors were dying. Their houses are being reduced to rubble. But every time there was a near miss, a bomb that went off next door but didn't kill them, 
rather than being closer to giving in, they, they were more resolved to hold out. Sometimes the near misses, the rejections, the pain are exactly what we need in order to have the strength to persevere. So maybe God was allowing Samuel to have just a little peek into the way it felt to be God. Just a little bit of the rejection that God had felt over and over so that Samuel could get a stiff upper lip and keep serving the people and keep steering them towards the Lord. You know, Samuel was still going to have some pretty tough stuff ahead of him dealing with Saul. Maybe God knew that Samuel's rejection here is what he would need in order to firm the resol- form the resolve he would need later. So what do we do when we're rejected? Do we run off and lick our sores? Do we get angry and lash out? Do we roll over and give up? Or do we trust? Trust that the God of the universe has not given up. Trust that the King of Kings is still at work sustaining all things, that he's right in the middle of the pain. He's not distant. He's not far away. And he's saying, I feel it too. But I'm not leaving. I'm staying right here. That's what invisible leaders do. Leaders who reflect glory to God have learned to trust God. They don't need to collect the glory for themselves. They don't need to collect the position. They don't need to say, I'm the one in charge. They reflect that to God, and by doing so, they learn to trust him. They learn to trust that he's not pulling out, he's not leaving, he's not saying it's scorched earth, I'm done, that he's going to stay there in the middle of the muck and the mud, and he's going to do the hard work, even when he's being rejected. Through the pain, they trust that God is still at work in all things. And maybe... If we learn to trust God, if we learn to trust that God is still at work, we can push aside the pain of rejection and we can choose to join him in his work, even when it's really hard. Let's stand together and let's continue in worship. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, His empire reigns. Glory to the nation, for Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring
be seated just for a minute. I, I've got a few announcements or things to share with you at this time. Uh, one, I want to draw your attention, the bulletin. There are a lot of things in the bulletin. This is your ministry prompt for the week. Things that are coming up, the prayer list. I will tell you that my niece, uh, Jill Vestering, she's been taken back to the doctor. Uh, she's about 50 years old, serious cancer, and they haven't been able to figure out exactly what all is going on. So these are people that need your continued prayers, not just her, but the others that are here. So this is your ministry prompt. I would also say that we, are, we continue to be in need of ministry assistance to help us whether it be in hosting uh, youth devotionals or helping with the children's ministry. There are many opportunities for ministry, and so I, I draw that to your attention. I want to thank, uh, thank our, our wonderful youth minister, family minister, for this little sheet. Uh, scripture readings, once again, that you can share with your family, read as a family, share with each other, and what you think that these scriptures are saying to you and your family, to take advantage of that. Uh, but uh, please, I know that, oh, and uh, I've got a, a, a group that is meeting today called Bake and Take. And we're meeting today, and it's to bake things and take things to people that are in need. And you may know, know somebody who has a need uh, for food or whatever. Uh, please give me or any of the people that are in our group uh, the information that you have so we can take advantage of that. I uh, would remind you of the giving. Uh, I'm going back and giving again. I encourage you to give that serious consideration uh, that that is an opportunity. And finally, I just want to say I can't say enough good things about our ministry team here. Um, I appreciate so much Jared and uh, Brian and what they're doing in ministry. I will tell you for Brian especially, anybody who stands up front, I speak as a former minister. You are the center of a target. You're not going to like something. And it's going to be directed oftentimes here. And I will tell you right now, with a big building project like we have going on right now, I've known a lot of preachers that have gone through building projects. And you know what happens right after the building project? The minister is gone. He is totally spent, exhausted from the million and one questions that come back to him because he's on site. So... I want you to appreciate our ministers and what they do, how much they give, and think for yourself what you get can give as far as helping with our youth, our families, prayer ministry, or any of our groups to be involved, not just to be uh, an audience that sits, soaks up on Sunday, and go home and not think about it till next Sunday. I challenge you with that. So with that said... Chuck, would you lead us in a word of prayer? We have so much to be thankful for. I want to take you back to a time before cell phones. Not that long ago. Some of you can't imagine that. But I can remember walking home from school, lived fairly close. At uh, grade school, middle school, and high school, I could walk home. And um, I would get home, and then I could call my friends because the phone was at home. And I would call them and say, hey, I'm coming over, or you come over, or whatever it was. But there was something that somebody discovered, and I heard about it, and I tried it. We could dial our own number, and that produced a busy tone. And some of you may not know what a busy tone is. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't get a voicemail. You didn't get an answering machine. You got... Duh, 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 duh. And someone learned that you could talk in those busy tones. Anybody ever do that? You could say, hey, this is Chuck, or whatever you want. You know, hey, who is, and you, you'd hear, Z -Z -Z -Z. and somehow the lines were connected. Crazy thinking. But through that, I had the thought, 
of what if I was on there and the lines were crossed, and sometimes lines cross too. In the old electronic days, you'd, you'd get a messed up line and you'd hear somebody talking and then you'd hang up and you might get another line or something. But what if I was talking on the phone or dialed a number and, and um, I heard that there was a plan to, and I thought of Paducah Regional Airport, what if there was a plan to blow up a plane back a long time ago? I don't, I don't know where I got the idea, but what if somebody, what would I do? What it, what extreme steps would I take to stop that? You know, you try to call the airport. If you didn't get through, you drive out there. You'd say, I've heard this on the phone. And I say all that to say the urgency I would have for those people I didn't even know. I wanted that to stop I, I, and crazy thoughts that I had. But I want to p place that in our minds of the lost around us of our neighbors how urgent of people that I wouldn't even know that I would want to stop that plane from blink being blown up well what is the outcome for people that are not believers and so what type of life do I leave to influence them what do I want to say to them what do I want to reach out to them how much urgency is there for them to have the life that we plan for someday with God that we have now in God and, and the, the trust and the salvation and the peace that we can have that they may be missing. So let me pray for that. Dear Father, I ask you to give us the eyes to our community to see the lost around us, to be compassionate to them, to not look at their sin and say, well, they deserve what has become. Let us realize that we are all sinners, that we sin daily, and these are fellow people on this earth with us that we want them to enjoy life and the peace of God please put us in their paths please let us be examples in our lives in Christ's name amen